our search for plenitude, our desire for knowledge, mimics or mirrors the progress of God, the progression, the history of God, the life cycle of God. He also notes that the mirror is a feminine principle, and he directly associates it, explicitly associates it with Sophia, with wisdom. It is the recognition of lack that marks wisdom. Now, in this, he's just very much in keeping with Plato. Socrates says, I am the most wise, not because I possess some technical knowledge, but because I recognize my own want. I recognize the gap in my knowledge. And that, too, seems to be the pattern that's being played out here. Later on, I'm going to talk about some of the influence that this idea has, particularly on thinkers within the uh, early German Romantic and German Idealist tradition, particularly Schelling, and the way that Schelling then introduces this idea of an emergent or developing God that is incredibly radical and becomes incredibly sophisticated, but is a way for him to think evil while at the one, on the one hand, avoiding the problem of attributing to God the creatorship of evil, but also at the same time avoiding the dualism of looking outside of God for the creation of evil. We also have to think of this historical God in terms of the fall, the separation. Very, very important for Lutheran theology. And this brings us to the second point, which is that God also suffers separation. And the separation is not a defect. The separation, the lack, is not a flaw. But rather, it is a necessary component of the production of history and the production of creation. It is the very source and being of the creative act. And when we think about this in human terms, this makes perfect sense. Why do we create? We create not because we have everything. We create because we desire to make something more than what we have. We desire to fill a gap. We desire to fill a gap either in ourselves, in someone else, in the world at large. And creativity then springs from, and revelation springs from, not plenitude, but want. So all of the falls, all of the mistakes, all of the separations are not evil, they're not dangerous, but rather they're necessary. They are the very thing that goes to build up what we're all working for as Christians, as Gnostics, as philosophers. This creates a problem for Ben, though. How does he then think Christ's redemption? How does he think incarnation? Why is it that God incarnates as a human being, takes on uh, a soul and a body like us, in, uh, <coughs> if not to save us from lack? And Bema's answer is very, very simple and very straightforward. It's because God has to experience that lack in order for God to be built back up. And so what we begin to see is a, is a historiological or historiographical tradition that looks at God not as something that is static and universal, but something that is being constructed, that is being formed, that is going to arrive in its plenitude. So this suffering is necessary both for God and for human beings, not in order to get back to the original state, not so that we can put everything back together because it was once together and it fell apart, but to say we started from the bottom, we started from the depth, and these separations are the things that we're going to be building back up. And so the ultimate conclusion is the arrival of humanity and God at a state that is superior to the original state. When we're looking at traditional Christian historiology, we normally see it as a kind of circle. We start with the Edenic state, or we start with the primeval state, which is perfection, and then there's this fall, and then Christ comes to redeem us, and we start to make our way back up, 
And as Gnostics, we believe eventually we will come to a point where all are reintegrated into the Pleroma, and we've then gotten back to the original state. We fixed something that got broken. Here, there's only upward movement. There's only evolution. There's only building. We start from, from the bottom, and what we form then is not a return to some primal Edenic state, but something much greater, something much more profound, where God becomes plenitude, God becomes fullness, God becomes perfection, not because he sort of always is that, but because we contribute to that. And so in both the Protestant and the Gnostic senses, human beings participate actively in the divinity of God. We as individuals contribute something to God's development. God needs us. God wants us not for his own sake and not for the sake of our others, but for the sake of the whole universe to contribute to this formation. So when we look at it in terms of history, when we look at it in terms of uh, the developmental nature of the God, or uh, what Manfred Frank calls the coming God, the arriving God, we see a radical transformation of Christian theology that takes place in this singular moment. How is this received? Well, we can imagine right off the bat how this is going to be received. A wonderful quote regarding the Aurora, which is one of uh, Boma's first publications, is that it has as many theological errors as it has lines. This was the, the description that was given of it. And it was soundly condemned by the Lutheran pastoral community. And yet, it, it did still have an influence. And Bema was still able to continue to write and produce. And so as a result of that, there is an influence that comes down through Bema, through the mystical tradition, into later German philosophy, into the mystical traditions, Rosicrucianism, etc., etc. And there are a number of people that are profoundly influenced by Bema's work. Uh, Hegel, Schelling, Hildelin, Novalis, the other... Uh, early German romantics and German idealists all explicitly refer to Bema. They all are looking to Bema. Hegel himself called Bema the first German philosopher. That's, that's a startling statement you know, coming from, from Hegel. It's not Kant. It's not Wolf. It's not uh, and any of the, the earlier German Enlightenment thinkers. It's Bema. It's this radical uh, thinker of the, uh, the 16th century. There's also an influence on people like George Fox, who's the founder of the Quakers. Fox himself said, this is required reading for every Quaker. Every Quaker should be reading Bema. Now, I happen to find that a little sadistic, because if you've ever <laughs> tried to read Bema, uh, you, know, you know that this is, it borders on incoherence. And there are a couple of reasons for this. First of all is Bema's lack of formal education. He was not a trained academic, nor was he a trained uh, ecclesiastic. He was not a theologian in the traditional sense of the word. He was a shoemaker. That's what he did for much of his life. And so there is a, a roughness about his writing that is sometimes difficult to overcome. There's also the fact that this is not a rationalist or an enlightenment document, but rather it is firmly rooted in the revelatory or mystical tradition. In fact, his first insight into the structure of the world comes from his contemplation of a beam of, of sunlight reflected in a, in a pewter dish. And he simply looks at this phenomenon, he simply observes this phenomenon, and in his contemplation of it, the world unfolds for him. This is also one of the big philosophical problems with Bema, because he can't argue his positions. He can't say, well, you know, this is rationally where this is coming from, and why this is a necessary account of how things have to be, but rather he simply says, 